The following program is brought to you by Element 14, the electronics community where you can connect and collaborate with top engineers from around the world. Join now at element14.com. Hello, my name is James and welcome back to Workbench Wednesdays, where we review tools for your electronics workbench. In this episode, I am going to look at equipment from Weller for soldering and desoldering through hole components. Now, astute viewers might notice that this is not from Weller. You're probably thinking, wow, the bald engineer does not even know what soldering equipment looks like. That's just a circuit board. And you're right. Well, about the circuit board. This computer is 35 years old, which means it is time to change the capacitors. That's a perfect project to get some hands-on time with soldering gear. To keep things balanced, I'm also going to work on a modern computer like the Raspberry Pi. For now, it's time to warm up the WXR3. And I don't know why I point it there. You don't know what's over there, do you? Before getting started, of course, I tinned my new soldering tip to make sure it was ready for use. Previously, I removed the logic board from the C64 case. As you can see, there is an EMI shield attached to it with these tabs. Using the Weller 120 watt soldering iron and American Beauty solder wick, I removed some of the solder blobs and bent the tabs out of place. On a few of the tabs, I used the pliers, which I talked about in another Workbench Wednesdays video. The shield comes off easily after the tabs are desoldered. For now, I'm just going to set this aside because at some point I need to replace it. This tool is the Weller WXDP120 desoldering iron. It connects to the WXR3's vac input and one of the heating channels. The tip heats up the solder joint and then a button activates the vacuum which sucks out the solder. By default, the pump stays on as long as the button is pressed. However, in the settings, you can set the delay on and delay off times independently, which I did. Once I see the solder joint melt, I press the button and then the vacuum runs for five seconds. Not only does this mean that you get consistent results, but it also makes the job go much quicker. There is a section on the C64 board which has an RF cage. It contains the video chip, also known as the VIC-2. I decided to take a few minutes now and just clean the old thermal paste off the chip. I'll add some new paste when I put the top of the RF cage back on. The reason I am replacing the ceramic capacitors, especially in this section, is that the ceramic values do drift over time. In fact, after 10 years, they can shift anywhere between 5 and 10% from their original value. These capacitors are almost 40 years old. The bad news is my desoldering tool cooled down while I was cleaning the VIC-2. The good news is it heats up from 180 to 350 degrees in a matter of seconds. Once it was up to temp, I removed about 10 ceramics and a few electrolytics. Putting the replacements back in took no time. For the capacitors, I switched to the WX65, which is a 65 watt iron. The smaller tip did require retinning almost every time I used it, but other than that, it worked great at getting into these tight spaces. The technique I used is that I soldered the top sides to secure the caps, then flipped the board over and finished the soldering. Afterwards, I just clipped off all the leads. Now it is time to replace the large bulk decoupling capacitors. And when most people think of replacing capacitors in vintage electronics, these are the caps that they tend to focus on. Because these caps are connected to huge ground planes on the circuit board, they need some help removing the solder. So I dab the connections with a flux pen. Flux really helps with desoldering since it removes any oxidation that is built up over time. In the pin form, it is easy to apply directly to a specific area without much fuss. The first capacitor fell out as I desoldered it. Since I want to use polymer aluminum capacitors, that meant I could not get them in an axial format. So now I need to get creative with how I place these radials. Later, I will add some hot glue for mechanical relief. The leads on this last capacitor would not fit the original holes, 
I needed to get the cathode or negative side to another ground point. Initially, I tried to use this diode. Then I realized that connection wasn't ground at all. So I moved the lead over to this ceramic capacitor instead. Now, thanks to clever editing, you don't see all the mistakes that I make, which brings me to a question for you. What are some of your biggest soldering blunders and how did you fix them? Later, head over to element14.com and let me know. Once the caps were in place, I made a few measurements with my 10 mm multimeter and moved to a quick power on test. Now that the caps are replaced on my Commodore, I want to move on to something more modern. The reason is that the C64, while the solder joints are old, they do have lead. Lead reduces the temperature needed for the tin and the solder to melt, which makes working with it easier. So let's take a look at something a little bit newer, which will contain lead-free solder, such as a Raspberry Pi 3. For this demo, I am using a brand new Pi. Right away, I noticed that the desoldering iron is not removing much solder. So I tried increasing the temperature, but the solder was just sticking around. No pun intended. Or was it? I decided to remove these filters. They keep solder from traveling into the vacuum and destroying it. Looking in the glass tube, I noticed that blobs of solder have built up. It's no wonder the sucking action is not working so well anymore. It is time to replace at least one of the filters inside of the tube. The one coming in contact with the solder is burned and is probably ready for a replacement. The others have some flux building up, but I'm not as worried about those yet, so I'm just going to replace one of them. These filters are only about a dollar each when bought in packs of 10. Um, let's go back to something that happened that you might have missed. When I opened up the solder chamber, did you notice a drop of solder fall out? In addition to the solder in the filters, the heater section is clogged. Fortunately, Weller has a tool which contains some picks and drill bits. It is designed to let you select a tool and then start poking at the clogged solder. After picking at the desolder tip a few times, I could poke all the way through. I also turned the heater back on, which allowed me to scrape the solder out of the housing. Now that the tip is clean, it's time to reassemble the tool. The twist lock of the retention module makes this a snap. Okay, that pun was intended. With the tool all clean, look how great it removes solder. It removed all the solder from a pin in a single attempt. Now I'm able to start moving really fast from pin to pin with little effort. Of course, the ground and power pins were a bit tougher to remove, but that's because the PCB planes act as a heat sink. So they just need a little bit of extra heat and some flux to help loosen them. As you can see, I wasn't able to remove the entire header pin block without damaging it. But more importantly, I am not damaging the Raspberry Pi. With the plastic retainer off, I used a vertical position to remove the pins one at a time. Now you could use a soldering iron to heat up the joint and pull the pin out. I kept using the desoldering tool so that the holes would not be filled with leftover solder. By the way, throughout the video I have been cleaning flux residue with these MG alcohol wipes, but I knew it was very important here. Once the socket is in place, there will be no way to get rid of that leftover flux. From Samtech, I have this small kit which includes a socket header for the Pi's GPIO pins, so let's use that. Knowing that some of the pins like ground need extra heat, I got to thinking, should I go back to the 120 watt iron or is there another option? My decision was to use a slightly wider tip on the WX65. There are so many tips available for Weller soldering irons and they are relatively cheap. Even for this professional line, they're only like $8 each. Since it's a new tip, of course I tend it and then I went right to town with the GPIO pins. The Weller WXR3 does a great job at maintaining tip temperature, so I was able to just fly through those connections. The result is a new Pi with sockets instead of pins. If you only need to desolder circuits on a few occasions, just having solder wick is probably enough. But if you're like me and have a pile of boards to work on, a proper desoldering tool like the WXDP120 will pay for itself in no time. Being able to switch between a 65 watt or 120 watt iron is an example of why I like Weller's modular system. Additionally, the variety of tips are exactly what you'd expect from a name brand. 
Now in my next soldering video, I'm going to cover reworking surface mount boards. And here is where I need your help. You see, a long time ago, I replaced a single component in this TI-85, which helped make it go faster. But I can't remember what I did. So do you know how to speed these up or have some ideas on what I could try? If so, go over to element14.com slash workbench Wednesdays. Head to the page for this video and leave a comment there. Oh, and don't forget, I also want to hear your most difficult soldering stories. Until next time, I'm getting back to my electronics workbench.